atmosphere on the second half of historical astronomy. And of course, there's so, so much more, but we're giving you guys the kind of broad brush view of this. Um, all this stuff is in chapter three and four. Um, the end of chapter three, at least in most of the recent editions of Cosmic Perspective, has this weird digression about what science is, and there's a flow chart. I've never met a scientist that has a how to do science flow chart. You can skip that stuff. Um, and then we'll actually skip a bit more physics and go straight to planets and come back and do telescopes and spectra afterwards. So we'll finish the week talking a bit about chapter seven. Um, so really that's it. And then next Wednesday's quiz will be all of the historical stuff and uh, some survey information about the solar system. Okay, so just as a lightning quick review is that this isn't new, or at least it wasn't at the time of Galileo, is that um, you know, 1,500 years before the so-called Galileo Fair, uh, there was this pretty diverse set of ideas. There were geocentric systems where the Earth was at the center and everything was spun around it. Um, and then there were heliocentric systems that people discussed and, you know, the high watermark of Greek culture where the sun was at the center and everything was spinning around that. And then there was none of the above. And probably by the time of the Romans, maybe people had started um, really just talking about sun at center versus earth at center. And certainly by the age of Christianity in Europe, people chose the geocentric system just because it seems to agree with scripture, I guess. Um, and it makes you feel nice, you know, you're at the center of the universe. So the details of the geocentric model that came to us, there were other ones, is that the Earth is completely stationary. This, the orbits of the... Uh, the celestial bodies are perfectly circular, except when they aren't. And they're perfectly circular because the celestial bodies are actually literally mounted on perfect crystal spheres. Of course, this doesn't explain something really important. It doesn't explain the so-called retrograde motion of planets, where this is against the fixed background of stars. Mars, for instance, pictured here, will go forward, prograde through the background of stars, stop, go retrograde against the background of stars, and then prograde again. And the Ptolemaic explanation for this is that because we're only permitted to have perfect spheres, perfect crystal spheres, I've got to take another crystal sphere and mount the crystal sphere on the crystal sphere. So I would have what's called an epicycle. And um, that wasn't enough. So then I had to have another epicycle and another epicycle. And by about 1450 or so, people were pretty, uh, pretty fed up with epicycles because the, um, the end of the... Um, Ptolemaic model, I think it ended up having to explain observations with about 65 of these. And again, people are doing algebraic computations with Roman numerals, so it really wasn't that fun. So, in fact, even now, if you want to insult a scientist, you say their theory has epicycles, like this nonsense that doesn't explain anything. It's unfortunately true. So the, um, the time was right for Copernicus, who's kind of an unlikely re revolutionary to write this book where he was exposed at some point in Italy to the idea of the heliocentric model. He still believed that they were perfect crystal spheres. And basically he got 60 epicycles, 65 epicycles down to 40 and was somewhat aware that this was a controversial topic. So more or less published this on his deathbed. Um, and the idea is that if you put the sun back at the center, you have a really natural explanation for um, the retrograde motion where this would be Mars and Earth and as Earth overtakes Mars, you see Mars in front of you and then behind you, it's apparently as if Mars is going retrograde with respect to the background of stars. And then as you circle back, you see Mars in front of you again. So the so-called loop the loop of Mars is just us going faster in an inner orbit. So that made little to no um, impression upon the literate scientific world, weirdly, um, until these two guys, Kepler and Brahe, and I'll ask again, anybody want to have dinner with Tycho Brahe? Yeah, it's probably a much more entertaining uh, proposition than it was last week. So Tycho had the best observations of anybody at the time, longest duration, most, uh, most precise, and then Kepler was this very inventive, brilliant theorist. And um, basically, 
Tico wanted to have Kepler justify his model, which was this weird sort of hybrid Copernican Ptolemaic model where um, moon orbits Earth and the rest of the planets orbit the sun, but then the Earth is still at the center. So in essence, it's like totally indistinguishable from the heliocentric model, except you just take all of the correct orbits and orbital locations. So, you know, Jupiter is orbiting the sun and Saturn is orbiting the sun, but then you just stick a pin in the Earth instead of the sun. So it was actually really, really close to correct, except this idea that the Earth was stationary was still um, embedded in his incorrect model. Um, so still geocentric. And Kepler came along, really bright guy, really weird guy. Um, potentially his mom poisoned Tycho, which may or may not be true, stole his data, discovered that um, the trick is you can't have circular orbits. So you need to have a, an elliptical set of orbits to describe things correctly. And you can salvage the Copernican model and you can put the sun at the center and not a single epicycle in sight as long as you let your orbits just deform a little bit and be a little bit non-circular. And Mars is the key to this because the farthest Mars is from the sun, what's called the aphelion, it's about 1.7 AU, and the closest it gets is 1.4 AU. This picture is not to scale, of course, um, but Mars is pretty eccentric and elliptical. And he wrote these laws, which is much, um, together they're much, much easier to use than keeping track of 65 tables and laboriously doing this arithmetic. And in fact, they're more accurate as well. And there are three of them, which is weird because, you know, even now scientists tend to write laws in groups of three out of deference to Kepler's laws, I think. But the important part is they're strictly mathematical and they're strictly geometrical. And this is where we stopped. So now we'll talk about what um, these words mean and how you would in practice use them. But any questions about that stuff up to now? So this really encompasses this picture, are Kepler's laws. And if I have this deformed elliptical um, orbit and this planet is revolving around the sun, so the sun is at one of the two so-called foci of the orbit. So you get, just got to pick one and put the sun there. I'll remind you guys what the focus is in a second. And the two things that were really confounding the epicycle people were the fact that one, the orbit isn't circular, but two, the planet doesn't go at a constant speed over its entire orbit. So as you get farther out, the planet slows down and closer in, it speeds up. And the rule for that um, law is that the planet will sweep out equal areas in this ellipse in equal times. So this slice of asymmetric pi and this slice of asymmetric pi and this slice of asymmetric pi are all the same area. So nobody would get shorted if we cut a pizza like this and we all picked a piece. They'd all be equal amounts of pizza. Somebody just might get more crossed. Okay. And finally, the total period is in proportion to the cube of the average distance, which is the one that doesn't quite show up on here, but this is actually the most remarkable of Kepler's laws, uh, law three. So we'll get to each of them. So first is how do you draw an ellipse? And if you were exposed to this in kindergarten or something, um, in geometry class, you drew an ellipse by having two pins and a loop of string. And you put the loop of string around the pins and then you stuck a pencil in the end and you drew a circle like that. Except the circle was deformed because the pins are offset. This is an ellipse and these two things are called the foci. And what, you know, maybe you saw in uh, trig or something like that is that this distance plus this distance are always equal. So those two segments, um, of the line are actually always equal. So this is an ellipse and the sun is located physically either there or there in Kepler's laws. Okay. So here is um, an ellipse and this is a real thing actually. So this is an orbit and these are dots taken, you know, think about it as like a stroboscopic picture once every year or so. So 1950 and da 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 da, looks like the dots are getting farther apart. 1986, it's within one AU. Um, Anybody know what that object is that's orbiting in this thing? Kepler didn't know this, actually. Yeah. What comet specifically? You know, Halley's, Halley's Comet. Yeah. So apparently this works for non-planets. And had Kepler gone through the historical record and noticed that every 76 years people describe some big comet in the sky and freak out about it, he may have conjectured that um, it was something being pulled around in a Keplerian ellipse. 
but this works too. And if you want to know where Halley's Comet is, you've got to put the sun at one of the two foci. Here's the other focus way out there. There's no sun there. That's the empty focus. It's where you'd call the position of the anti-sun, which sounds kind of cool. Um, and animated in real life, it looks like this. So let's, let's have planet orbiting, and let's make it really eccentric. So slower, faster, slower, faster. And there's the empty focus that restores the symmetry. Like physically? Yeah. Nothing. It's just because the if you fold an ellipse like this, it's symmetrical, and you fold it like that, it's symmetrical. Um, so it's got this place where, you know, imagine that the sun was wet ink, and you fold the paper over, it would make a impression. Yeah. Yeah, there's no astronomical significant to, significance to it. It's just because the orbit itself is an ellipse. It's got some extra symmetry to it. There's, like, nothing there, and there shouldn't be anything there. It's not like space debris would aggregate there or something like that. Do you know why right. the orbits are ellipses and not perfect circles? Yes, um, and that takes until Newton to figure out why they're ellipses and not perfect circles. In fact, it's really hard to make a perfect circle, um, and it's easier to make an ellipse. Because if you look at the mathematical law that describes gravity, is, um, and this is the distance you are from the sun in this case, so that would be zero, is there's only one spot where your distance to the sun never changes. And if you just like sneeze on this object and give it a little bit more energy, it'll start bouncing back and forth. And then you, you know, nudge it a little bit more, it'll be more and more elliptical. So there's one and only one energy, the minimum energy uh, orbit would have a perfect circle. And then any, anything that bumps it would make it deviate from normal. Do we know if so. with a perfectly circular orbit? No. I mean, it's, it's a mathematical it's artifice. Unstable. It's not that it's unstable. It's just literally you like sneeze on this thing and you deform it from is perfection. It so, well, stability is a different uh, idea. Is that stability is this versus this. Oh, okay. So yeah. unstable would be if I sneeze on it and it goes off to infinity, never to return. Stable is that I sneeze on it and it just wobbles back and forth, but it does return. So yeah. It only, it only returns and remains to be stable because of gravitational mass, like the sun. Yeah, so the sun is what's. Now, this thing, this feature over here, is the one that's difficult to explain, but this is basically the closer you are to the sun, the more it pulls. This is basically the angular momentum of the thing orbiting. And in the same way that it's like really hard to walk towards the center of a spinning piece of playground equipment, it's hard to push a planet that's orbiting towards the center of the body. So this is um, the so-called angular momentum barrier. But overall, it makes this. And if you flick this thing, it'll return. But you know, if you just nudge it by any amount, it'll start wobbling back and forth. So the circle really is perfection. And nothing, nothing really exhibits perfect circular orbits. Um, okay, good. So the second law has to do with the equal areas and equal times. And what I can do is, um, there we go, turn this on. I think there are some ticks associated with it too. But basically, every equal time, these things are being swept out. So equal, equal areas, all equal areas. And we know why this is now, but um, at the time, it was just considered sort of a magical coincidence. In fact, it's a pretty remarkable coincidence, too. But those are Kepler's laws. And eventually, they'll work for a lot of other things. Kepler um, postulated them for the planets. Okay. So now we can use them in a pretty outlandish circumstance. So these are these pictures. I think this is about um, 12 years or so, maybe a little bit more, 20 years, of data from the galactic center. And this is a star. So the star is here, 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 here. And these are radio, I think, observations of a star. And it seems to be orbiting nothing. So what is it orbiting? We've gotten that far, at least. Yeah, this is orbiting the supermassive black hole. Um, where exactly is the supermassive black hole?
I like the foci, definitely. So it's going to be one of the two foci, which means it's here or here. So these are equal, er, uh, sorry, well, from here to here is. Are you sure? So from here to here, bigger distance? No, it's an It slows down. So that's slower than that? So these are all equal area, equal time. So from here to here is two years, and there to there is two years, there to there is two years, two years, two years, two years, two years. So which two-year slice of time is it moving the most? Upper one. So which of these two foci have the supermassive black hole? Right. So there, because these areas are probably equal-ish. So these long, skinny uh, pizza slices and these short, fat ones. So honestly, the supermassive black hole is right there. Yep, those are also stars orbiting the supermassive black hole, and they're inferred elliptis. What's that? This one? Yeah. Yeah, perfect is perfect, though. So, you know, I mean, honestly, like, the deviation from, uh, from a perfect circle of Earth's orbit is, like, nothing that you would notice over the course of your entire lifetime. But perfect is perfect. So, yeah, so right there, supermassive black hole, not a real picture. Good. So they're easy, they're accurate. Why didn't people just immediately jump on the Kepler bandwagon? Um, so there's something else they do, which is pretty remarkable that I'll show you in a minute. Um, in 1631, it was almost like this um, kind of, um, I don't know, like when the computer beat that guy at Jeopardy or something like that, or chess. This is like one of those moments where you have these two competing schemes in history, and one clearly shows the other one up, is that there was a transit of Mercury that was predicted in 1631. And at this point, there are two groups of people in, um, in Europe, and half of them, I don't know if it's half, but a bunch of them were computing stuff with the old Rudolphine tables and the epicycles and laboring through. And then there were the people who adopted Kepler's laws. And the people who adopted Kepler's laws got it right to an absurd degree. And of course, you don't want to sit there staring at the sun when you don't have to. So this is a moment where it really clearly demonstrated that Kepler's laws work really well. So this famous transit was you know, kind of pulled a lot of people into the Kepler's laws bandwagon. Um, it'll be important later, and you know, we, we actually know the answer, because you guys know stuff about forces and gravity and things like that. But Kepler's third law was a thing that didn't exist up until this point. So up until you know, the end of the Ptolemaic discussions and you know, Copernicus, is that all of these spheres, these crystal spheres and their epicycles, there was absolutely no reason to why they were spun at whatever speed they were spun at. So the crystal sphere of the sun was spun around the Earth at some like rant, you know, 24 hours. And then the crystal sphere of uh, the moon was spun at 24 hours less 1 28th. And then the crystal sphere of you know, Mars and Jupiter, they're just like totally random, selected on you know, day four of creation. Um, and they have no relationship to each other whatsoever. Because you're thinking about things as Earth at the center. If you actually look at a heliocentric model and you look at Kepler's third law, what it's saying is that there seems to be a relationship in between your distance and the speed at which you spin. And it's a very well-known, precise mathematical law. And if you were looking for some body orbiting right here in between Mars and Jupiter, I know exactly how long it's going to take for that thing to orbit, instead of it just being like totally random. However, you know, God wanted to spin them. So this, so why is this actually, now that we, you know? So this just expresses the fact that the law of gravity gets weaker as you go farther out. So Mercury is being tugged really hard by the sun's gravity and Pluto less so much. Um, but before that, this was not a relationship that people would think to consider. And there's a mystery here that will take until Newton to explain. So this is the cube of the um, cube of the orbit is proportional to the square of the distance, and we'll use it in fact because the slope of this line essentially is telling you the mass and the gravitational pull of the, the sun. So nobody even knew that this was a problem, right? Okay. 
Okay, so there were lingering doubts. Um, one is that if you put the sun at the center of the solar system and you have the Earth orbit it, you have the problem of motion again. Um, specifically, the problem of motion, and you guys calculated this, is we're moving around the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. So that gets you to Tacoma in about a second. So that's very fast. And if you went to from here to Tacoma in a second with the top down on your vehicle, you would definitely feel that. So why don't we feel that? And then the second objection is not a real one. It's these non-circular orbits. Just the, you know, the, I can't find it, but there's some clause somewhere in some book that says everything's got to be circular. You know, there's some philosophical idea that the heavens need to be perfect. And then objection three, which is a legitimate one, is again, well, we're moving from you know from January to June we're going to AU if we're the one that's in motion. And so what I should see is this phenomenon of stellar parallax, where closer stars and farther stars should shift back and forth. And this is a thing that you should see even if uh, the stars are all painted on a crystal sphere. So imagine that I painted some stars on this chalkboard or whiteboard, and I started moving my head closer to the side. I would see the stars still apparently shift relative to each other as they kind of foreshortened and um, lengthen. So you'd still see parallax even if you have this like celestial sphere wallpaper idea. Yeah. The planet goes retrograde because of um, the fact that we're in motion around it. Parallax is literally just you change your baseline and things that are closer appear to shift more. Yeah. So the Retrograde motion is because both of the bodies are in motion themselves. Parallax is just because some things are closer, some things are farther. And as we go this, or as we should go this 2 AU distance, things shift back and forth. And nobody saw this, but you know maybe it's just the stars are really far away. Um, so those are the objections to Kepler's laws circa you know, 1600 or so, 1607. So then there's this guy who's an unlikely also unlikely scientific revolutionary. So there's Galileo. Um, he's on like postage stamps and he's like Mr. Science now. Um, he actually had a pretty, again, non-traditional background for this. Uh, it's like a math instructor and uh, doctor at the University of Pisa, but what he really wanted to do was make money. Um, so he was constantly inventing these weird gadgets. Um, so this delicate hydrostatic balance where he realized through the principles of buoyancy that if you submerge the weights in um, some fluid, it actually makes the thing a little bit more sensitive. This is a Galileo thermometer where all of these things also have different um, uh, amounts of fluid in the glass baubles. And so they actually float at different temperatures. And so the one that's suspended in the middle basically is saying like, I don't know, like probably 17 degrees Celsius or something like that. And that's, I mean, that's like legitimately scientific. Um, and then he would do stuff like this. This is Galileo's military compass, which I think he just stapled a slide rule to a compass and sold it to some army people because even 400 years ago, you can sell army people anything for way too much money. Um, he walked away from his University of Pisa position and went to Venice, which at the time was like uh, New York, very cosmopolitan, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation and... Um, Things like the Inquisition had not touched it. It was a very open, culturally cosmopolitan city. And he um, was trying to make money. Uh, one of the things that he heard about was this trick that Dutch scientists had come up with where you put two lenses, one lens and another lens, separated by a tube, and it made far things look closer. Like he literally just heard a story about this. And within 24 hours, he had fabricated his own telescope, which had about a magnification of like three times or so, based on the descriptions. So what do you think the first thing that Galileo did with his telescope was? No. No. Possibly. Um, the first thing that we know about that he did. So this is, you know... You're right to say these things because we have this picture of Galileo as, like, again, Mr. Science. Um, the first thing he did, publicly at least, is he went down to the piers and um, he would look at ships that were sailing into the harbor. And if you have a pretty good telescope and you can identify the ship, like, 
You know, these things sell very slowly. A couple of hours before everybody else does, and let's say you know it's from Morocco or something like that, and you know that it's bringing pepper, I don't know, but silk, whatever. What do you know is going to happen to the price of silk or pepper in the marketplace in about three hours? So you offload what you have and you tell your friends. Um, people still do this. It's called arbitrage. There are microwave relays in between uh, Chicago and New York that get light back and forth in like milliseconds so people can front run the price of gold if they go out of sync and stuff like that. So he actually did arbitrage and tried to like, again, hustle financial markets. Okay, at some point he got tired of that and he looked at the sky. And what he noticed was imperfection everywhere. So looked at the moon and specifically these things were supposedly mounted on crystal spheres and perfect crystal spheres themselves. Um, with a reasonable telescope, you can see shadows crawling across them, and you can definitely see that they've got topology. Um, you don't really think about this, but the difference in between the highest and the lowest point on the moon is about the same actual distance as it is on Earth, about 8,000 meters. So there are differences in height of uh, lunar features about the size of Mount Everest. And then we don't know exactly how he did it with like smoked glass or projecting it on a screen, but he also looked at the sun and he saw rashes of sunspots and he saw that they moved over the course of days. So that's interesting. There's imperfection everywhere. This isn't anything to really freak out about. And I think the point at which he probably freaked out was he looked at Jupiter and he discovered that Jupiter has four planets that orbit Jupiter. So at this point in time, there were five planets. So in a single viewing, to discover four more is pretty remarkable. Um, so we now call these the Galilean moons, Io and um, Ganymede, Europa, and uh, what did I miss? Callisto. You guys know more obscure Greek mythology. You guys know who those guys were? You know who Jupiter was? Yeah, Jupiter, Zeus, king of the gods. And then Io, Callisto, Ganymede, and Europa were... You totally whitewashed these people. You don't realize how nasty they were. There are four... Actually, your textbook even might say four young women, but Ganymede was a boy. Um, three young women and one young man who Jupiter seduced, so they're in orbit around him. Galileo named them, so he's, you know, he's very Italian. And then Saturn has ears, apparently. So he looked at Saturn, and he saw these weird diffuse blobs on either side of it. So all of this is very, very striking. And this happened in the course of you know like months, weeks. So this needs to be reported. And this is a remarkable set of facts. Um, so a little bit less exciting, but still really interesting, is the Milky Way, which you know if you don't have a telescope, really just looks like kind of a rash of white light, um, actually gets composed into uncountable stars. And there was a set of star catalogs. You know, They thought they were complete. So there's a Greek star catalog that catalogs all 800 stars. There's a Babylonian one that catalogs all 6,000 of them. So people thought there was like some finite and countable number of stars, and we could give them all names. Um, but one look at the Milky Way with even a reasonable telescope. At this point, it was about 30 times magnification. Um, it was enough to completely dispel that. So the Milky Way is totally lousy with stars. And these are, uh, these are Galileo's sketches. So this is Galileo's sketch of the Pleiades. This is what the Pleiades would look like with you know, maybe just taking a picture that really doesn't magnify too much. Um, this is what the Pleiades look like with a modern telescope. So these are the seven sisters that Orion was chasing. Um, so even with like a little bit of help, you see that, wow, there's actually a full cluster of stars there. And it turns out it's a very young, very important cluster of stars when we get there. Um, anybody know either the Japanese name for this constellation or what it looks like that you've probably seen a whole bunch of times before in the Pacific Northwest? Hopefully not too close while it was moving. What's that? Yeah, I don't know why that, I think it's, if you're at a different um, latitude, maybe you rotate it a little bit, but there's the, the cluster and then the offset star. That's Subaru. Okay, so this you have to publish. And this is the way that things worked back then is um, 
you know, there weren't established liter or sorry, established scientific journals. You would basically publish a book, and if your science was really good, then people would buy it and you would make money. Um, so this was the bestseller of all bestsellers in the um, 16th and 17th century. So Sidereus Nunctus is what it was called, Starry Night. And this is Galileo talking about how amazing he was and says, you know, all of these new things. Four new planets, which is pretty impressive. Um, this was done in Florence, which again is a pretty safe city to be in. But again, remember that this was done, um, you know, during this schism in between like the Catholic and the Protestant churches and this guy. Pretty close to the same time, like in 1600, this... Um, uh, and Giordano Bruno published a book where he proposed, as well as having some schemes to remember astronomical facts, he, uh, he proposed the idea of like co-atomism, where every star had planets around it. This isn't shocking to us now. And each one of those planets had like an Earth-like planet, and each one of those Earths had an Adam and an Eve on it, and basically there was this multiplicity of experiments going on. So he was tricked into showing up. Somebody said, like, I'd like to be your patron and give you money to do your work. He showed up, and they captured him and tortured him to death. Um, so being somewhat mindful of this, um, after the publication of... Um, of Starry Night, the uh, Catholic Church actually like loved Galileo. He was Italian, he was Catholic, and um, the person who ended up being Pope shortly after, forget which one it was, but um, new Pope was elected in like 1620 or something like that. Galileo immediately went to him and said, hey, you remember me? We were at the same cocktail parties. Um, I'm thinking about doing this whole like Copernican worldview thing, and he was like, no problem. Um, as long as you don't hold the views as the truth, you can like publish stuff about it. You just can't say it's the truth. So you can discuss it, but you can't say it's you know it's not in contest. So it's kind of like what happens now with evolution. And he's like, great. So I'm going to keep working. This is what you guys will do later in the class. Is you'll notice what Galileo did about the phases of a planet tell you incontrovertibly whether or not it's orbiting the sun. So, for instance, if something's not orbiting the sun, could I ever expect to see a full phase or nearly full phase? No, there's always going to be 50% of it that's lit up, and that side is going to be away from us. However, in a Copernican system, I get to see all possible phases. Now, seeing a full Venus might be hard because the sun's in the way, so you have to wait until you know, early morning or late evening or something like that. But the phases of Venus, as viewed through a telescope, absolutely indicate that the Copernican view is correct. Um, he worked on the physics behind it, basically systematically went through all of the objections to Copernicus, uh, sorry, Kepler's laws and the idea of the problem of motion that we're zipping along at 30 kilometers per second um, has a very natural physical explanation. So you're, this isn't what he was thinking. I think his analogy was a boat and very, very, very calm seas. But you're sitting in a flight, the flight's going at 550 kilometers per second. Do you notice it if the air is really still? Do you take a ball and you throw it up and catch it? Is that okay, or does it fly towards the back of the plane at 550 kilometers per second? That's fine, too. When do you notice the fact that you're in a plane, really? It's when you take off and when you land. So what Galileo reasoned is that you can't feel velocities. Speed doesn't mean anything. The only thing that you can feel is differences in velocities, which Newton will put a stronger statement on later. But basically, we can do this. We can be zipping along at 30 kilometers per second. If we were to stop and immediately go to zero, then there would be troubles. trouble. But just being, you know, moving quickly through the cosmos is not a problem at all. So this is what's called Galilean relativity. And, um, you know, again, thinking that he had the blessing of the Pope, trying out all his material with the, um, with the academics of the time, he wrote a second book where he thought that he had um, kind of adhered to the letter of the law and he wasn't explicitly um, acknowledging or teaching the Copernican worldview. What he did is wrote this thing which is called a dialogue concerning the chief world systems where, I don't know who's who, but there's a person named... Salwiati, named after his friend, 
And then there's a person named Sagredo, who's like this really clever but uninformed person. And then there's somebody named Simplicio. And uh, Saliate is arguing for the Copernican worldview in Simplicio, which in, you know, means what you think it means, like stupid guy, is arguing for the Ptolemaic worldview. And over the course of three days in these dialogues, they're all discussing and uh, fielding objections. And it's really, really clear who Galileo is backing. It's so really clearly backing the Copernican worldview. Um, to this day, I don't think anybody knows why, but Galileo went further and put like words of the Pope in Simplicio's mouth. So there's a character in this book named Dumbass, and he's literally quoting the Pope, um, which isn't really the brightest thing to do. So this thing is published. It's got all of his new material about Galilean relativity, some actually bogus arguments about tides, which he thought were caused by Earth being in motion, um, not the moon, and then this whole shtick with the phases of Venus, which is actually very compelling evidence, publishes it, immediately flies off the shelf, another Galileo bestseller, He's immediately summoned to the Inquisition because, you know, um, Pope turns out not to be as kindly of a person as he thought. In fact, when they were having their, you know, their six interviews ten years earlier in the gardens of the Vatican, um, there were no birds in the Vatican gardens because the Pope didn't like the way they chirped, so he had them killed. It's like a very unpopely thing to do, I thought, but... Um, so Galileo is summoned to the Vatican, put before the Inquisition. He's like 60 at this point, so he's an old man. They confront him with these forged documents, told him, telling him that he couldn't have published this book. He was not allowed to threaten him with torture, force him to recant. He lives the rest of his life in house arrest. Um, and this book is banned. So Galileo dies kind of out in the Tuscan countryside. That's not the worst thing ever, I think. Um, but... Uh, this kind of quashes intellectual life in um, in Italy and the Mediterranean to have you know Galileo be um, basically have his ideas quashed and suppressed by the Pope. So in 1992 he was pardoned. So we we forgive them. Um, <laughs> does anybody know what this thing is? There's something that looks like it. Sort of, yeah. Um, these are reliquaries. I don't know if anybody's actually like been to these old cathedrals in Europe where off in the side they've got these things like it's the leg bone of St. Ignatius or something like that, and it's so obviously like a pig or something, I don't know. But they put holy artifacts in these very elaborately decorated chambers. And I, I think it was the set of librarians or something like that, but out of spite this thing was made. So this is Galileo Galilei's middle finger. So he was not allowed to be buried in church property, so he was like interred in the wall of a building, and one of the librarians in the town that had that building like hacked him out and pulled off his middle finger and put it in this reliquary. And it's in the Museum of Science in Florence, and it's always kept facing Rome. So people remember this, actually. So there was no reason why we had to have this cultural schism in between science and religion, but this is really where it starts. So this, like these two big personalities of Galileo, who's a very um, argumentative person, and Pope Urban VIII, who killed birds and liked arguing too. So this is really it, and all this stuff like didn't really need to be. And there are other places around the world where you would never have to, you know, be set this either-or proposition, is either you believe in you know, the religious doctrine, or you believe in science. So this is really where it comes from, this one set of two personalities, which is kind of weird. Okay. So the important part is that uh, Galileo died in about 1642, and on December 25th of that year, this guy was born, and basically here's where the story picks up. So there's like 20 years of just languishing because nobody wanted to, you know, be threatened with torture and have librarians cut their middle finger off or whatever. So the other thing is the story picks up in England, um, which is uh, um, after Revolution Protestant culture. So this guy, um, let's see if we should stop there. But yeah, why not? Um, so what's Newton famous for? All of that stuff. So laws of motion being hit by an apple, which is apparently a fake story. And it's not really that... I don't know. The story goes like this, right? So he's sitting in a field, and then he gets hit by an apple, and then suddenly has all these brilliant ideas. It's actually not really the case. So his story was that 
apple falls, and he noticed that the force that compels the apple to fall towards Earth is the same force that compels the moon to be pulled towards Earth, except the moon is just in orbit, in a circular orbit. And then he realizes that, well, I can figure out how fast the moon must be going if it's in a circular orbit, and I know that the moon is about 60 times the Earth radius away, so the force seems to be falling off based on my calculation by 1 3,600th, which is 60 squared, so the force of gravity must fall off like 1 over R squared. And this is what happened when the apple hit him. He's a pretty smart guy. Um, but this is where we'll pick up, and that's the end of history, because we actually still use this. So Newton is famous for universal law of gravitation, and universal is really important, and laws of motion. So what is it in Kepler's third law that's compelling these bodies to go at this precisely determined rate? It's the force of gravity. So there must be a mathematical law that says, how far are you? This is how far I'm going to pull you. So gravity is a force that acts in between any two massive objects. It works like this. I find my mass, I find your mass, I multiply them together, figure out how far away we are, square that, and then multiply by a constant called Newton's constant. So proportional to the masses, proportional to the inverse square of the distance. So as the distances get bigger, gravity actually decreases. Which is why I don't care about Andromeda's gravitational uh, pull. So he also came up with laws of motion, which are also universal and describe how everything moves, and we'll get into this on Friday. So Law one, law two, law three. There are three laws here. If you've gotten into this and learned some physics, it may have occurred to you at some point that law one is just a total trivial extension of law two. I just happen to have acceleration equal zero. The reason this was done is because Newton was paying homage to uh, Kepler and wanted to have three laws, just like Kepler did. Um, so the important part to move forward, and then we'll stop in a, a minute, is that these are like velocities. They have both uh, size and direction. And to say that um, the sun is pulling Earth around an orbit, I have to give the size of that force, and I also have to tell you where. So for instance, Earth in May, I would describe the force that Earth puts on, sorry, the sun puts on Earth is maybe in the direction of Aries, or in November, in the direction of Libra. It's truly speaking a vector. It's got both size and direction, which is important. Knowing that, um, and we won't do it, but you could derive all of Kepler's laws with Newton's laws. So what's going on at point B? So the sun and planet, and the planet is being pulled by the sun in this direction. So why is it that the planet is slowing down? It's larger because they're closer, and then it's pulling in which direction? A little bit behind it, right? So if the planet's trying to zoom off this way and the force is pulling that way, so imagine that you're trying to run this way and I'm pulling on one of your back belt loops. You end up slowing down a little bit. Yeah, so slowing down, slowing down, slowing down, and then from I to J to K to L to M. Now what's happening here is force is getting bigger, but then the force is also pulling which way? pulling towards the front. So that's the hand-wavy argument, but you can actually totally derive Kepler's laws using Newton's laws. Um, and they completely subsume them. We'll use Kepler's laws for things in orbit just because they're easier, easier than calculating um, distances and multiplying by g or something like that. So it was total vindication. Kepler was really, really, really right. And the groundwork for that was laid by um, Galileo and his relativity, and then finally mathematically by Newton and his force of gravity. Okay, So this, why does this line appear so straight? Well, there's a mathematical law that underlies it, and this is Newton's gravity. Right. Okay. So finally, philosophically, the universal is important. Um, and the idea that, you know, had he done nothing else, Newton would have been famous for this, I think, is that... Um, he said that the same law that causes the moon to fall towards Earth is the same law that causes the apple to fall towards the ground. And before that, this idea was pretty foreign, where there were earthly laws and earthly physics and earthly crap, 
And then outside of that, there were like the incorruptible spheres of the heavens, and they were all moving with their own like particular bizarre motive forces that had nothing to do with the earthly ones. If you say that the same laws that apply on earth apply in the heavens and vice versa, you actually get a lot. So what you get is that we can do experiments on earth that apply to stuff in space. And if you observe a bizarre phenomena in space, you can do an experiment on earth that checks it out. So the at the end of this, and the complete, you know, taken to absurdity is, um, this idea taken to an absurd end is this 30 kilometer long tunnel along the Swiss French border. So there's a human for scale. And this is the Large Hadron Collider. So they're smashing protons into each other to simulate uh, conditions one tenth of one billionth of a second after the Big Bang. You really have to believe that the same laws of physics apply at all times and at all places to do that. Otherwise, you know, this is like an incredible waste of money. So, and it's, you know, we take it for granted now, right? You've heard about LHC and, you know, you kind of take this, um, again, for totally as given. But up until 400 years ago, 350 years ago, the idea that you actually had the same stuff going on on Earth and not on Earth was not, not known. So the universal part is very important. Um, we'll pick up with actually how you use them in practice and take a tour of the gal uh, sorry the solar system on Friday, unless everybody's really um, efficient at doing exercise three. Any questions about that stuff? Okay. <laughs>